panel with NASA researchers who are working with a project that identifies the most complex and wicked problems of society and innovates on how aviation can provide solutions. I want to again remind our viewers that the IO tool will be open so you can pose your question for our panel members and that link is in the YouTube chat. NASA's Convergent Aeronautic Solutions, or CAS project, invests in seemingly improbable ideas that might lead to solutions to the problems that plague aviation and impact safety, the environment, the global growth and air traffic, and the communities we all live and work in. So how does CAS discover these wicked problem spaces and synthesize opportunities? And what happens during the process of early innovation? Hello, my name is Steve Cromaldi, and I have the pleasure of moderating our next panel discussion with three wonderful researchers who I have been lucky enough to work with on the CAS project. Leveraging off the topic we just heard regarding how ideas become innovations, our next panelists will share their experiences in CAS, including examples of where these early innovations take shape. You will hear how, at times, their research can shift focus to exciting new directions that could not be anticipated prior to digging into the problem space. Today, we are joined by NASA researchers Bree Damadia, Luke Bard, and Seth Schisler. I'm going to have each of them briefly introduce themselves and their work before we begin. First, I'll start with you, Bree. Bree, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your work? Of course. Thanks, Steve. Hi, everyone. I'm Bree Damadia. I'm an engineer here at the NASA Glenn Research Center. I am the PI on one of our CAS efforts called Sparky, which is sensor-based prognostics to avoid runaway reactions and catastrophic ignition. It's a bit of a mouthful, but that's why we call it Sparky. Um, in Sparky, we're looking at some really advanced techniques like embedded sensors and non-destructive evaluation to provide more data for us to do modeling and prognostics to help predict and prevent catastrophic failures in batteries for aviation. So when we're talking about large batteries for powering electric aircraft, that's the kind of safety level we're talking about so that everybody can get where they need to go in the next generation air taxis safely. Great. Thank you, Bree. Welcome to Imagine Aviation. Luke, let's hear about your work as well. Hi. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, Luke Bard, I'm a meteorologist here at NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center, Southern California. I'm a co-investigator for a CAS effort known as AeroCAST, which is the, uh, like, like Bree's uh, work, the very long acronym, Advanced Exploration of Reliable Operations at Low Altitude Meteorology Simulation and Technology. So there's uh, many uh, avenues that we're trying to explore. Basically, uh, how can, on the meteorology end, can we uh, uh, help with the uh, advanced air mobility community? So better understanding of wind conditions and the built environment, uh, novel sensor developments and atmospheric measurement and modeling techniques, uh, potential value, value to the UAM community and uh, provide a higher density data set of atmospheric measurements uh, in a built environment for researchers to use. So some very exciting stuff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Luke. Appreciate it. Welcome to Imagine Aviation. Seth, go ahead, sir. Hey, good day, Steve and everybody. Happy to be here. Uh, my name is Seth Trisler. I'm a senior engineering project manager. I am principal investigator of beaming energy or uh, beaming energy for air mobility, uh, also known as BEAM. Uh, so I'm located uh, at uh, NASA's Ames Research Center uh, in Silicon Valley, California. Uh, and our primary uh, research effort uh, for BEAM uh, is how to enable uh, wireless energy or energy augmentation to in-flight uh, electrified vehicles. Um, so often uh, you hear of different fuel budgets um, from traditional aircraft going from point A to B. We have different fuel reserves how does that happen when, you're, uh, when your aircraft is all battery? Um, so we're first looking at providing an emergency uh, power alternative uh, to safely, safely and reliably land uh, aircraft uh, with humans uh, and cargo, uh, and then also be able to apply uh, powered assisted takeoff and landing in the future. Oh, thank you, Seth. As you all hear, this, these, these three and their teams are working on tremendously important uh, research, and I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. So again, uh, a reminder, the IO tool is open, uh, the link on YouTube. Feel free to throw some questions in there. I'll, I'll pull them in here and there when we have time. Uh, but I'll kick us off with one to start us off. Uh, Luke, I'll go ahead and start with you. 
Um, talk to us a little more about some of the details in, in Aerocast, how it got started, uh, and maybe how this effort has changed over time. Yeah, so Aerocast started off as actually two different efforts. It was a micro weather moderation. So how can we uh, incorporate not just the meteorology and aviation, but what about civil engineering? Can we potentially modify the built environment to make it safer for UAM vehicles to fly? So um, things like overhangs, baffles, uh, some ideas that came out of there. Uh, can we you know, build and test these uh, in a real environment? Um, that was uh, uh, one avenue. The other uh, uh, project was the ubiquitous weather sensing, which was more on the end of the measurement and modeling techniques. How can we use these uh, UAM vehicles as weather sensors themselves? How can they provide additional weather sensing information? And uh, is there a way that we can uh, take that information and feed it back to uh, weather models or even uh, decision-making tools for air traffic management. So um, the projects uh, had similar um, ideas, so we ended up merging the two uh, in, in one of our, our pivots to, to try to join the efforts and uh, make the best of both worlds. So, so it, as, you, as you bring a few of these efforts together when they were a little more nebulous in the discovery part of CAS, what are some of the advantages you saw to interconnect maybe initially disparate activities as you now bring them together in components of a system? Yeah, bringing them together. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's always a, a fun thing to do um, with, uh, you know, trying to... Uh, uh, get uh, um, um. did you know have you noticed has Sorry. there are there more positives and negatives let me say regarding on how to pull things together uh when you combine components of a system does it enable more technology advancement or does it complicate the system more and your research more yeah, you know, you're trying to pull things together. Uh, certainly, you know, that's one of the challenges we had, I think, was trying to uh, pull together several things. Um, even when you get into things like the, the building moderation uh, devices, uh, can this be uh, tested in a, in a you know, real environment? Um, so some, some of the challenges there being, um, you know, time scales of, and, and, and uh, resources to try to develop something on a quick uh, a turnaround. Right, so, right. And that's, and that's difficult, and, we, and, and we've talked about that, and you're going to hear a lot more in Imagine Aviation about that. This early innovation, how do you rapidly get it? So uh, I, I can understand the difficulties there, but, but I also understand the, the benefits that could come from such an advanced, uh, advanced uh, approach to this. And, and Seth, similarly, I know the BEAM efforts you're working on now uh, came out of, similarly, there's what, what Luke said, a CAS effort entitled Energy for AAM at Scale. And as I understand it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, that initial effort uncovered a larger ecosystem of areas that would enable the burgeoning advanced air mobility effort. How does your work on BEAM fit into this ecosystem and, and what could the technologies that you're researching help enable in society? That, that, that's a, a large question. I'll help to unpack that in, in a couple of <laughs> stages. Um, so first, kind of the initial you know, ideation, the discovery phase, as you mentioned, so energy you know, at scale. So we know there is a problem of how do you, you know, augment the energy state of, of a battery that's flying, right? And so we had about a team of about six or seven different uh, principal investigators like myself, all with direct and indirect ways of augmenting the energy state. Some from flying battery drones that mate to the bottom of the aircraft, flying tethers uh, to, um, to you know, different uh, other, let's just say, uh, scout robotics that would help while also mitigating the airspace. So it really under uncovered a huge uh, different ecosystem, uh, you know, an energy web or this Wi-Fi energy um, that's needed. Um, so similar to our uh, communications structure, it, you need to be able to uh, be able to point uh, and understand that. Uh, but ultimately, we, we down selected uh, based on the way to, to, to give the most energy, the safest uh, and then what we were able to then go forward with. So we were able to down select wireless power transmission, mm -hmm. uh, also known as power beaming uh, or delivering any amount of energy without mass. Um, so we looked at uh, you know, your, your induction charging, your, your optical millimeter uh, microwave, 
uh, but ultimately wanted a, an all weather application. Um, and so we, we are now going for, further uh, with going into a microwave uh, power beaming application. We, so after that, uh, that, after that discovery phase, we then went into a safety study to go, okay, how would we actually go to an airspace, block this off, and then be able to safely and effectively control our beam and our hazard um, for per passengers or cargo. Um, so that was kind of the evolution. We've, we've now kind of went through three naming uh, cycles with better acronyms along the way from EVES to Empress uh, to BEAM. Uh, I'll just mention the, the last one, BEAM, uh, as our best acronym for beaming energy for air mobility. Uh, but it was, it, it, it was a, a lot of uh, support uh, and then kind of just showed the diversity of thought and then the support you get within CAS to, to kind of proceed forward optimistically and aggressively. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the the different changes, uh, the different names is is funny as well. But the changes of the, uh, as as you progress through early research, you notice different components that come up, uh, and, and it might lead you down a different path. And and I think I think it's good to understand that some of this research isn't cut and dry. We, in this stage, it's very important to be open and explore this. Uh, and Bree, you've worked with, with Cass the longest set of people on this panel. Prior to Sparky, you were on an earlier effort of Cass, but what changes or evolutions have you seen in the, prog uh, in the project uh, in, the way that the, in the way that the researchers are allowed to approach this almost to the point I raised, allowing the flexibility of going in different direction where the research shows? But how is this flexibility and how the changes in Cass impacted the exploration of innovation in your current work? So I've actually been on four CAS projects, but who's counting? Exactly. Um, I, I, yeah, so I've been involved in CAS uh, for years now, and it's been interesting to see how things have changed over that time because early on, CAS is all about convergence. And so that's bringing together multiple disciplines, bringing together multiple solutions, trying to come up with something unique that nobody else does or, or nobody else has thought of before. And that process has gotten a lot more organic over time. So there's a lot more exposure, I think, from people mm -hmm. like myself that's at you know, Glenn Research Center to the folks that are doing this really cool research at the other centers. And some people don't realize just how many people we have doing all these different things spread across all of our aeronautic centers. And you know, we've, we've really got hundreds and thousands of people doing unique R&D that you'd never think to call up and ask about what they're doing and how it fits in with what you're doing. And I think CAS has allowed us to do that a lot better than than how we did in the past. I also think that over time, CAS has really evolved into how to identify the big problems in aeronautics. And there have been different different versions of that. So in the, the earliest versions, it was a big question that aeronautics asked us to solve. And then the next iteration that we came in with Sparky was to us for us to identify our own problem and how our, our solution fit that problem. And now there's a lot more engagement with venture capitalists mm. and industry and other NASA projects to weigh in on what their needs are and what their big gaps are and how we can do those features feasibility assessments to try to poke around and see what kind of cool, unique solutions we have to fit those problems. And I think that's one of the, the best things that, that CAS has evolved over the years that I've been involved. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point of, of, of how the, the research can be connected, should be connected and driven by the needs of society and, and the needs of, of any stakeholders that we may engage with. Um, really excited to hear the engagement you go through. And, and, and it's funny, you mentioned uh, the VC world and, and Seth, uh, you know, we know that government funded research is, is much different than what happens in the private sector. But similar to what Bree just kind of hinted at there and started mentioning at the end of her statement, do you see any parallels in the way the CAS allows the ability for rapid prototyping and adjustment and how it might compare to initiatives in the venture capital world in the private sector? Absolutely, Steve. I think I've, I've noted this before. Kind of each each of our different cast teams. You know, once we get into our execution, where we're uh, we've now proved you know our concept, proved what we're going to be research. Talk to our uh, angel investors or uh, our advisors within NASA uh, to go give us money uh, or give us funding, so to speak, uh, to go tackle this problem. So then we get the autonomy to go build our small teams, 
uh, align our resources. So I have a, a, a great team of engineers at Glim. You know, we're, we're occupying a brand new laboratory, an aerospace communications facility um, that, that's uh, over at Glenn, uh, and showcasing new uh, capabilities there as well. So we're, we're able to align all of our verticals, <laughs> which, you know, where, where we you know, manufacture everything, because um, a lot of times what we do at NASA, you cannot buy off the shelf, especially with what we're doing uh, when we're creating policy and new technology along the way. Um, so just like um, you know, small startups uh, and then other kind of small um, business that are funded by NASA, we do um, have early engagement with commercial um, part, with commercial providers uh, of similar technology and other government agencies um, to make sure we're not having blinders on, and knowing that NASA is not the only folks you know doing this, and making sure that you know our research is you know apples to apples you know with you know other partners within within our government. So uh, very similar, uh, where we we have quarterly kind of calls and milestones of saying this is what we've been doing, uh, and then we have uh, times to, to pivot uh, based on uh, some of our our metrics um, that we've uh, we've noted before. Oh, that's great. Bree, Bri, have you had similar experiences of en engaging with the private sector and, and seeing, oh, maybe maybe there's an overlap here and we should stay away from, or boy, there's a void that no one's looking at, and this is really a sweet spot for us to dig into. So the latter part of what you just said was our early um, interactions with folks was a recogn recognition that there was a gap that existed that we we had a solution for and everyone else recognized this is a, a serious problem didn't have a solution and thought wow this would be this would be a really great thing if you were able to bring this to fruition so we were able to talk to a few different places uh, about you know what things would be the most relevant for them and the most useful and we've actually we've actually interacted now since then with some other government agencies as well that are doing things in a similar fashion or have similar needs but for different applications so you you go along that that route and and you may have started out thinking that your solution was specifically for what you were aiming at, which makes sense. You know, we're looking at electri electrified aviation, but realize that some of the other government agencies or the private industry folks are looking at other applications where there could be relevance. For, for Sparky, that's electric vehicles, which are, you know, it's a huge booming industry. And sometimes you don't think about that when you're you're focused on your specific need or your specific application. So that's a, a great way to to kind of broaden um, your interactions with folks when you you kind of look at that more expansive list of of folks that could be impacted by what you're trying to do. Right, right, and I, and I love how you put that. That by, by not only partnering with other stakeholders or, or policy members or other governmental agencies, but trying to understand the impact of what the work can do and having that adjust or, or direct uh, direct the, the research you do. And, and Luke, you have to run into this a lot too, even if you're working with the private sector. And they, you know, if it's vehicle manufacturers, if it's designers, they may not have meteorologists on staff. They may not have the weather instrumentation that y you and your team and NASA can bring to it. So if you, ex how do you experience going into someone outside of NASA and kind of uh, accentuating the weather experience and the weather tools you have and they have? What's been your experience with that? You know, a lot of it has been uh, modeling. You know, there's oh. so many different models out there. I mean, some can't tell you how many times I've heard, oh, we've, we've used the windy model. Like, oh, that's, that's just a product and there's different uh, uh, models that are part of that. So there's a, there's a lot of products that are out there that are geared to, hey, we've taken uh, measurements, but we're, you know, we're putting into some product that can give us what uh, typically what we're asked for is we, we need to know what the winds or what weather conditions are everywhere at the same time in ev like three dimensions everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's just not feasible. So there's going to be some inherent things. So yeah, the, the models appeal to that. Um, but is it real? So there's a sense of validation of these models. And that's kind of what Aerocast is trying to do is to help validate some of the um, more novel things coming online. For example, uh, machine learning. Uh, can we use CFD um, to to help uh, understand the atmosphere better? Um, so it's more um, you know, computation time expensive and uh, resource expensive to do that. But we've got the expertise here to do that. 
Right, so, right. And when you work with and, and maybe introduce or have a clarifying conversation with other partners about what models might be best, I assume you're also sometimes giving them maybe news they don't want to hear regarding, well, you need to use these models for certain applications. And if you're not looking at this, you could be in trouble. So how, how do you have those conversations? Well, we measure it. I mean, <laughs> the, you know, we, uh, the, uh, you know, models are a good guess. The answer key is the measurements, but of course, measurements have their own uh, uh, shortcomings too. We can't measure everything all at once, but really, and that's what we're trying to uh, do is um, collect a lot of measurements uh, in as many ways as we can and uh, try to quality control it. So that's another thing too, trying to uh, assess that your measurements are good. Um, so uh, we do inner comparisons and um, we're, we're working on a data set right now, uh, especially in a very data starved environment. That's one of the things that in the community right now uh, for air mobility, it's like, hey, we've got uh, this uh, sensor network that's been set up at airports. They're in you know, open areas and there's uh, standards that have been built around that. Well, the urban environments, everything's wind blocked and you know, it's, you know, we're working in a very non-standard sense. So the others, uh, the ASTM committee, um, did the standards development. So they're they're looking into um, how can we, is there a way to standardize weather measurements for urban areas, non-standard locations um, and, uh, um, and, and things like that. So, I mean, maybe to um, uh, Bree's point to talking about the, um, like applications we didn't expect, you know, this is getting into things like uh, 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 system-wide safety, GPS, GNS uh, navigation in, 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 you know, in, in cities, the degradation. So we have to know things like, uh, you know, what are the wind conditions? So can a model really tell you that? You know, you can believe the model all you want, but, you know, is it real? So right. we need right. to measure it. So that, that kind of we're you know, there ties in the thread there of like actually taking the observations and trying to validate um, models to for folks who you know may not be just trying to um, uh, fly in in cities but uh trying to fly it but uh, right the and different the applications for, for that yeah i'm sorry about that and that's what i was going to say it's important to connect the data and the data analysis to the specific applications that they're looking for and, and, and brie that makes me think of if your effort in Spark, I believe it was initiated focusing on the safety of batteries for aviation, but have you drawn any interest from any other industries, any other applications that maybe wasn't your focal point when you begun the research? Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier electric vehicles and we I just got off the phone earlier this morning actually with another government agency lab who is contracted with a third government agency lab to do some safety assessments on battery health for electric vehicles. They're mm -hmm. looking at different chemistries uh, to try to improve safety while keeping the performance at a high level. And, and so we were talking to them about some of the non-destructive evaluation techniques that we've been developing out of our uh, Langley research labs. And it's, it's a huge area that could be impactful be, even just beyond that. Really, we're talking about applications for non-destructive evaluation that could be implemented as the batteries are being manufactured to try to uh, get rid of some of the batteries that have failures that can't be detected in some of the other ways that we that we do now uh, or in use when we're talking about more the the sparky specific things where we had, had pictured it actually implemented in an aircraft and being able to monitor it in real time so when you think about that it, they could really be used in any application where you have a battery that you want some more insight into the the you know goings on of the day-to-day -day use and especially larger scale batteries that are being used for stationary energy storage or anywhere that you want that added level of reliability and safety oh and that's wonderful and and i'm hearing this throughout all three of, of your works that uh, the applications and the expanded uh, array of applications that they can have in society and and I know a couple of you, we, we've talked before and you mentioned it's that's part of that discovery opportunity in the early part of the innovation. And what CAS helps drive is understanding the overall system, understanding the problem space, understanding the desirability in society that and then sure, I can still focus in one direction, but I have that knowledge base to know, oh, here's something else that could potentially 
uh, be an application for the research I'm using. And, and maybe there's a new partner we could come on uh, and a new partner that might take the research even farther. Um, and I, again, reminder to throw some questions in the IO tool. There's a few popping up. I'm going to I'm going to grab a couple of I'm going to grab one now and then but uh, keep loading those up in there. Uh, Seth, a question from IO. Uh, can you talk about the insights and opportunities that universities can collaborate with NASA or AAM? So hey, the work you're doing, has there been any work with or partnerships with universities or more importantly, potential that could come about later? Yeah. And, and this is, you know, as you're doing a, a wireless uh, invisible technology, uh, there's always somebody working on it. Um, so we're always uh, staying pretty close uh, to, to the bleeding edge of what's going on. Uh, we do have uh, certain interns coming on from different uh, that uh, that awarded that were awarded internships as part of our Blue Skies competition, uh, which was also part of uh, our our UI initiative, our university initiative uh, here uh, with IntactP. In addition to that, there's there's other th um, applications. So there's you know the Watts on the Moon challenge. Um, so it's very similar uh, type of problem uh, of where to get energy where you need it most. Um, and so we we do look at uh, challenges, both NASA uh, space and NASA, NASA Aero. Uh, so kind of uh, all throughout the uh, the acronym there. Um, and there's always new opportunities coming up as well. Um, so we are um, right now in uh, more of the early TRL development phase. Um, so we do have a, a lot of new academics coming on. Um, but as we do get further into our research, more testing, uh, we'll definitely uh, want to uh, understand and uh, what the, the university um, you know, environment is doing and seeing how we can kind of, you know, mesh together. Uh, we're always looking at ways to, to de-risk uh, and to not do all the testing uh, here in NASA. Right, right. And this is so, just to all of you, when, when, when research is completed, if it's not, or the stages have been completed in your work or, or pre-previous efforts or, or Luke and Seth and the other non-cast research you might have done, when efforts are completed, how, how are they distributed to society? How are they put out there? So maybe research institutions or educational institutions that do research can say, hey, wait a minute, that's that's something I'm going to contact the author and, and talk about uh, some work that might be going on for that. So how do we get how do we get it out there? How do we get our work out there so others can leverage from it? I'll jump in real quick. Okay. So, so the way we, we try to do it, just like with anything else, uh, so if you're an actor or anybody else trying to explain the movie you're going on to, you go and do talk shows or, or certain conferences like this one. Uh, and they say, hey, this is what we're doing uh, with your, your, your taxpayers' dollars. So we have conferences, we have, we have papers, uh, which are publications, uh, which you know, then you can go link us to all sorts of different things. And then you know, a lot of us are having our own patents as well. Mm -hmm. um, so as you know, we heard, I think the previous panel, you know, making sure you kind of protect your IP, your patent, you know, that is another way to quickly have, you know, the U.S. commerce, you know, license it and be able to do use it in other applications. And I, you know, I think you agree. And there's another solid state battery team savers uh, that, you know, actively have patents that, that are that are being being utilized. So patents, publications and presentations uh, generally help. And then we have competitions on the side as well. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, I'll actually add to uh, yeah, yeah, Seth. Um, so I went to the uh, American Meteorologic Society. They had their annual conference. You mentioned conferences. So um, this is a couple weeks ago. And there was somebody actually asked me a question of like, they're, they're an engineer, an aeronautics engineer, and they're at this meteorology conference. So their big question to me was, well, how do you transition? Like, you know, these big ideas, like, you know, it's really fine focused weather research, how do you get that into the hands of the people who could potentially use it? Like engineer, how do you, you know, transition, you know, the knowledge here to another field of people who can use it? And uh, I just happened to notice that uh, within the annual uh, conference, like they have all these little, um, you know, sub-conferences, all their little uh, committees have their uh, groups. And one of them, they actually have a committee for that. So I wish I would have attended it, but uh, nonetheless, they, like at conferences, uh, they do have, uh, it's a great way to share ideas. And if you have a committee on a conference uh, that can help distill some of that information and share it, like how do you apply it? You know, that's uh, uh, great to see. Oh uh, yeah, thank you both. Bree, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just had one piece of, of info that nobody else mentioned. Uh, we've put out a couple videos that get the word out to the, the general public about what we're doing. And in a way that everybody can understand because 
I know, you know, talking from one expert to another in my area, you know, we can talk all the nitty gritty details all day long. But when I hear Seth or Luke talking about their projects, most of it goes in one ear and out the other when you're really in those technical details. So I think an important piece of that, you know, is, is getting information out to the public in a way that everybody can relate to and think of how that would affect them in their in their lives. Right. So that's that's a, a big piece that we've been trying to work on, too. Oh, that, that's excellent. Uh, and that brings me I'm going to pull a question for you, Brie, while you're on in this that's in, from the I.O. tool. Uh, are you interested in measuring the state of the battery electrolyte? So the short answer is yes, but in, in a way that's not specifically focused on the electrolyte. So we're focused more on the cell as a whole. So including all of the other guts and everything that's inside the cell, not just the electrolyte, looking at it from a perspective of the health of the cell overall. And what can we tell from the changes in the morphology of how the, the cell looks when we're doing some of these visual scans, or some of the other data that we're collecting from the embedded sensors. So really it's looking at a more holistic approach for the, for the cell versus just one specific component. But that, that is a piece of it though. Great, oh, wonderful, thank you. Uh, another question, and I'll encourage people, we have a few minutes left, keep cranking them out there. Uh, Luke, will Aerocast research impact the National Weather Service? That's a good question. Um, so I could see potentially, uh, you know, we think about weather service as uh, providing our uh, weather forecasts uh, and it's basically you know to protect lives and property so if there's any application there that we can come up with um, especially if we're trying to collect higher density measurements so uh, that can certainly be of benefit to um, uh, the weather service and and probably know at large um, i know there are efforts uh, going on uh, within the uh, SBIRs and within uh, certain other uh, communities. Uh, I know Dallas, uh, uh, Fort Worth, uh, they've got a um, uh, group down there that is uh, trying to study hyperlocal weather. So uh, they're trying to incorporate things like weather radar and, uh, and uh, a high density measurements. So uh, I can certainly see that um, inputs, uh, especially in cities, data starved areas right now, uh, this could be a benefit to the National Weather Service and the forecast products they put out. And right. any of the technology that we're developing too, uh, I don't know if, uh, hard to say if the CFD or machine learning will, but I could certainly see a potential value in, in forecasting tools for them. Right, and then and then hopefully continue to enable their mission to make, in, in our case, aviation safer when these new technologies, new vehicles come online. Absolutely. Great, uh, Seth, and I'll, and every, please, everyone can jump into this. I'll just I'll just start with Seth. But uh, what new technologies have you begun to introduce or discover that you, you know you probably you might not have planned for when you first begun the effort you're working on now? Has anything else popped up and thought, well, there's a thread I think we'd really like to pull on because there's something there? Yeah, yeah. So there's. Uh, well, I'll break it down to the three three levels. When you're when you're transferring energy, there is the the where you transfer it from, the transmitter, where you're receiving it from, uh, and then where you store it. Um, so you know, all of which are very important, all of which are are very unique uh, and are creating their own technology. Um, so we needed a, a very high you know high temperature solid state battery, uh, which is very very new. So we are partnering with with another team uh, at CAS to help. Uh, realize one of the applications uh, um, for that one. Then when it comes to the actual, you know, rectifying antenna or our rectenna, uh, where we're kind of dubbing it the, the, the power tile. So think of your shuttle, you know, uh, kind of thermal protection tile. It's made up of multiple different layers. Within each one of those layers, you know, there, there are certain unique technology, unique material. You know, we're, we're protecting against thermal, you know, uh, different uh, uh, radiation that we're, you know, that you know that you have with any type of communication. You know, just like with radar or anything else, making sure you're protecting everything. And then on the transmit side itself, so to you know, uh, a little bit different than your traditional radars, which you know kind of just spread. Now you have to have dynamic beam, you know. Uh, beam shaping, beam forming control. So now think of, you know, you're making a columnized beam. Uh, and so then, you know, that you know, takes in a lot of phased array, um, you, know, um, you know, transmitters approaches, then you start getting into, um, you know, the actual components. Um, so almost every single portion of it is touching new technology uh, um, or, or creating new technology uh, as, as we go along. 
and I, that's one of that's one of the joys I, I, I love being around with Cass and early innovation. You, you discover something and then you, you dig into it, but then something else pops up and you can go down that route. Um, maybe it focuses on my ADD. You can go in different directions and explore a lot of this, but it's fun and it's great because you're, you're really discovering uh, the components of the system. And we're in the early end, obviously, of the TRL scale, but as it goes forward, you envision the impact on society, it is going to have to have this systematic approach. So Bree, similar, have you discovered newer technologies or, or intentionally stumbled on something or, or accidentally stumbled in a good way on this something that it's like, well, I'm gonna continue on this, my team is, or at least I'm going to note it for other research going forward. Almost every day. Uh, a lot of a lot of our project is R and D focused. So you know you're you're in the lab and you're trying something new. And when you're trying something new, sometimes you get the results that you're expecting. Sometimes you don't. More often than not, you don't. And that usually spurs another question or another path that we'd like to take. And sometimes we're able to dig further a little bit, you know, into that. Sometimes we just have limited time and we have to stay a little bit more focused, which can be tough. Again, with the ADD thing, you you want to run off and do that fancy new shiny thing. Uh, but we we definitely make it a point to to note those things and those different um, spin offs or or concepts that we'd really like to spend more time on. Because honestly, in the, the several years that we worked on Sparky, we probably identified a hundred different areas that would be beneficial to, to look into more that would each probably be their own separate effort that could go on for years just to understand more about what we were doing. So it, I mean, yeah, every day. Every day. <laughs> That's great. And that makes it exciting. That makes it interesting and, and fun for the team as well. Um, and Luke, a little bit on that, but more on another question I'm going to pull that I'll uh, ask again, of who anyone can chime in, but I'll start with you, Luke. Um, you know, we heard Seth mention, the question is, does the research in one CAS area impact others? And Seth, you alluded to how it connects to another CAS effort, uh, Sabres uh, looking at batteries. Um, some of the things, Bree, you mentioned that too, but Luke, have, have you seen any of the work your team is doing, uh, really being able, if not today, but tomorrow, quote unquote, to impact other CAS activities or other activities in NASA aviation even? Well, certainly. I mean, especially within uh, the work we're doing is uh, focused on advanced air mobility. So there's uh, programs out there that uh, already you know, involved in that, such as the uh, Air Mobility Pathfinders, um, the work that we're doing there with uh, AFWorks Agility Prime, Joby. So an actual air mobility vehicle. This is something that could directly transition to um, uh, uh, the, the focus that they have. And uh, RVLT, for example, uh, there are things like ride quality. So, you know, how does the, you know, weather measurement translate to what it does to the vehicle? Translates to what a uh, passenger on an air taxi would experience. So, I mean, yeah. And so the RVLT, the Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Project, in Ca and, and we love our acronyms in NASA. So sorry. <laughs> we have to catch ourselves All on that. Yes. So I'm sure I've thrown some out. No one's caught me. So <laughs> all, all good on that. I want to, th we're running a little low on time here. I think we could go for a few hours, um, but there's such oh, wonderful sorry. content in this conference, but there's one other question here, a couple others from the IO. So what do you see as the biggest struggle in discovering a new technology and then bringing it to a level that industry can take it on? I, I, I deal with that every day. Um, so, so, uh, there is a, another form of, of what I'm doing, um, but that has a different application, uh, called directed energy. Um, but so there is, um, educating, uh, kind of the difference, um, between, you know, other uses, uh, into the, you know, the, the state that we're using it. So a lot of time it is, it's, it's definitions and applications of our technology. Um, and, you know, we're, we're always trying to reduce our carbon footprint uh, and then make electrified flight uh, more a, a closer thing into reality for us. So uh, it's every day and, and terminology uh, or desirability, uh, as we, we like to, to, to mention, uh, is always. Nice. Brie, thoughts on the same question? Yeah, sometimes there's there's just a, a gap between where we see our research going and what the application sees that their need is. And so it, it really is beneficial to come together early on and talk to those stakeholders and get inputs on the kind of direction, if you've got flexibility in your direction that you decide to take, 
so that you can make things that you're doing more appealing to be able to let them flow more organically into industry rather than than try to force them you know square peg round hole situation we don't right. want to end up with with that uh but but rather engage early and engage often and so that's i'm glad you mentioned that as well and there's a one more question i want to get at even though i'm going to push your time limit. So 30 seconds, if you could, is what advice would you give industry stakeholders on how to connect and work together with researchers to enable their cutting edge research while simultaneously driving the development of industry solutions? Luke, you go first. 30 seconds. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I can come up with something quickly here, but um, talk with us. There you go. <laughs> well, and that, that is, it's not just a joke. You can reach out to uh, the uh, principal investigators at any time and talk yeah. about their research. And we do, we do share a lot of that and it's on the website of at least the initiative and efforts. Um, Seth, Bree, anything quickly to add to that? We, we, we do uh, space act agreements all the time. Uh, a lot of times no exchange of funds, just exchanging idea and person and personnel and testing. And that's a lot of times how we get things done. Uh, we have a uh, Team, you know, super teams uh, of, of excellence, you know, mm -hmm. challenging a problem from, you know, government side to commercial. Um, so I, it's early uh, conversation uh, and being open uh, and trying to uh, not protect uh, your IP, uh, having, a, you know, kind of, tr you know, transformative open uh, platform to science is always, always a good deal. Bree. We have whole teams in our technology transfer offices that help engage with this specific thing. So, you know, reach out to POCs at the centers and they'll connect you with the right folks. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I love talking to you all. You know, I have worked with all of you individually before, but I love talking it uh, not only for the brilliance of the efforts you and your teams are doing, but the excitement, the thrill. Uh, you all thoroughly enjoy your work, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And Certainly. It, and Unique opportunities here. Yeah, it, it's beautiful. So uh, I want to I want to spend some time here. Thank first everyone in the audience and the questions are through in the I.O. Beautiful. I wish we could got to all of them out of time. But I really want to thank uh, our team members, our panel members here, cast researchers, Bree Damadia, Luke Bard and Seth Schisler, along with your teams. And the pers you're just personifying the new era of thought leadership that this Imagine Aviation Conference is showcasing this year. So thank you so much for being a part of Imagine Aviation. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Steve. And now as we head to our first break of the day, please enjoy a brief video showcasing the work of one of our panelists, Brita Madia and Sparky. Work to revolutionize the future of aviation often starts with a what if. What if we can fly safer, faster, longer? At NASA, our Convergent Aeronautics Solutions Team, or CAS, apply innovation and curiosity to explore the what ifs. Hi, I'm Bree Damadia, an engineer at NASA's Glenn Research Center. Curiosity must run in my family because my dad is also an engineer here at NASA Glenn. And I have two sisters who are engineers. At home, or in the lab, we're always asking, what if? Most of my research at NASA focuses on testing and development for next generation batteries. So I ask myself, what if there's a way to build an aircraft battery that can self-predict and prevent catastrophic failure? We've all heard stories of lithium batteries catching fire, which prevents using them for electric airplanes or air taxis since we have to design a safe containment system. To address this challenge, our team is working on sensor-based prognostics to avoid runaway reactions and catastrophic ignition, or SPARKY, to provide safer batteries. The advancement of all electric planes will depend on batteries that are powerful enough to sustain long flights. More energy placed in a battery could increase the severity of a fire, and electric airplanes don't have the luxury of pulling over to the side of the road like an electric car. These failures are what the Sparky team aims to prevent. We already know that chemical and structural changes occur inside of a battery before it catches fire. Sensors implanted in battery cells and non-destructive techniques 
will monitor changes to provide important information and detect early failure. Sparky is our solution to help newer transportation options get you safely to your destination, whether it's an electric plane or an electric car. Sparky Research is supported by CAS. To learn more about Sparky, CAS, and other NASA projects, visit www.nasa.gov slash CAS. Welcome back to IA Network News, a great start to Imagine Aviation. And now, an update on our breaking news this morning. NASA's beloved aeronautics flying squirrel, Orville, has been spotted at NASA's Glenn Research Center checking out the icing research tunnel. The IRT, as NASA calls it, is the longest running icing facility in the world. Concerns are mounting that the squirrel is not dressed for the climate and certainly not for the tunnel, which can produce air speeds from 50 to 325 knots and temperatures as low as minus 35 degrees Celsius. IA Network News urges you to send in your Orville sightings and hopes we can return him safely to his warm den at NASA headquarters. We'll be back after the break with more exciting programming here and Imagine Aviation 2024.